Hi, everyone. This is a uh, much larger audience than I thought I'd originally get. So hopefully, I'll uh, have enough to talk to you about to all of you. And uh, we'll all come away very, very happy. That's my goal here. So this is uh, 2D gameplay tricks and tips. And uh, my name's John Manning. I'm a PhD student at the University of Tasmania. I'm one of the founders of uh, the development company Secret Lab, who you po might possibly have heard of over the course of this uh, conference. We really didn't mean to take over, but uh, whoops. And I'm also a uh, software engineer at Mebo, where we uh, do a lot of work with sharing and uh, some also uh, relevant stuff to this talk as well. Um, so really, given that this is a talk and a session about uh, 2D gameplay, I really think that it's uh, relevant to take it retro. So as I said, uh, I'm one of the founders of Secret Lab, yada yada, Mebo, yada yada, Utahs, yada yada. Really, that's the boring stuff that you don't really want to know that much about because I'm here to tell you about things that you don't know already. You aren't here to learn about me, you're here to learn about this fantastic thing here. But I need to tell you why you should pay attention to me because really you're going to give up an hour of your time to uh, uh, pay attention to me. So one of the things that uh, Secret Lab does is uh, we work on this game here uh, called Heroes of the North, which is about the battles of Canadian superheroes. It's also a web series and a comic book series, figurines, and uh, there's a feature film in the work as well. So that's what, that's what we do. And that's, what, uh, where, uh, that's basically my, my background to justify why, why I'm telling you about game design and stuff. I'm also uh, an author of uh, two uh, game development books, one about the iPhone and the iPad, and one about uh, developing games for the Unity game engine. And I'm going to talk briefly about how, uh, why you should use uh, both of these later on. And additionally, besides games, I'm also involved in a whole bunch of different uh, application, uh, like non-game stuff as well. But that's, you know, that, that's just the background. I'm not going to dwell on that. Because really, this is about you. Now, I make two assumptions about everybody in this room. I assume that you want to make some games. Somewhere in the back of your mind, there's some idea of a game that you think, that would be fun to play. I wouldn't mind playing that. And you have some idea of what you want to make. You have some idea of, of, of how it might play. You have, you, you've maybe sat down and you've whiled away a couple of hours thinking, mm, and then it had the explosion there, and then it'd be like a sword, and then there'd be like a quest. And so those are the two assumptions that I make about you. I, I, I hope they're accurate. Because if not, then you might spend the next uh, hour going, well, this is all well and good, but why? So I'm here to talk to you specifically about some ideas and tips and uh, useful techniques for building 2D games, now, specifically 2D games. Not 3D, although a lot of the stuff that I'll tell you about is equally relevant. But I'm focusing on 2D for a bunch of reasons that I'm going to uh, tell you about. So 2D games have a long and rich history. In fact, they were the first kind of computer game. The very first one, of course, was Space War back in the uh, early 70s, I think. Um, and of course, uh, it exploded onto the scene uh, with uh, this one. Who remembers this guy? And 2D games are quite beloved by uh, gamers because they have led to the development of many, many wonderful uh, stories and uh, gameplay experiences and things that people like to share. Things like Monkey Island. I mean, yeah, yes, I, I, if, you, if you go, yes. <laughs> but of course, it isn't just old games, despite my choice of font in this presentation. It isn't just old stuff that is relevant to uh, the world of 2D. I mean, one of the most recent uh, games that took the world by storm was uh, World of Goo by 2D Boy. Who's played uh, World of Goo? Very good. I'm, clearly, I'm in the company of uh, very uh, cultured and uh, people with taste. So 2D games have a lot of room and a lot of, they're, they're, not, they're not simply a throwback or a retro thing. So why would you make Two games in 2D when it's by now it's very very obvious that 3D is kind of the established uh, form for games. You know, it's like saying, well, why would I want to paint when I've got lithographs? I'm going to show you a couple of reasons why you might want to consider making a 2D game rather than a 3D game. No matter how tempting it is to say, uh, well, you know, in 3D I can have uh, like laser warriors with explosions, and I've got spacecraft, and I've got a flight simulator, and then I can run across the open fields of Hyrule and, and save the princess. Well, that's all well and good, but that's actually really, really hard to do. It's very difficult to do that. So the first reason is that, well, 2D games are much easier to make. There's a lot less that you need to provide in terms of resources and in terms of skill and in terms of initial upfront work to make them. 
2D games are much, much easier to put together, both in terms of the construction and in terms of the conceptualization. There's less work for you to do. And because there's less work for you to do, there's now a lot less time that you need to put into it before you can have something out there on the market. So that's the first reason. 2D games are much, much easier to make. So as an example, there's this game here, Half-Life 2. Took six years to make and nearly bankrupted all the uh, people involved uh, with uh, Valve. In fact, uh, Gabe Newell put all of his entire personal fortune into it and it nearly uh, cost him everything. By contrast, uh, and of course, Half-Life 2 has done amazingly well and, and it, it's one of the uh, 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 initial go-to points for uh, when you want to show games as a good medium for uh, creativity. But by contrast, this took six years. Cannabolt has also made millions, not as many millions, but still has made millions, and was made, it took a single day to make. It was, it was put together as part of a day-long competition and put up online and said, hey, I made this thing, what do you think? And people replied saying, this is incredible. And, of course, uh, Adam Saltzman, the guy who wrote it, uh, said, well, that's pretty good. I'll, I might just port it to the iPhone and uh, see how that goes and sold it for three bucks a pop and uh, now uh, doesn't have to work a, a, a day in his life. So, 2D games, much, much easier to make. And because they're easy to make, it means that you can do your prototyping a lot faster. Oops. You can do your prototyping a lot faster. So this is so, so important. Who here uh, has made a complete project comp program from start to finish without any mistakes and without ever having to revise anything? The same is doubly so for games. Games require you to make mistakes. They require you to fail. You will not make a good game if you went from start to finish without revising any concepts. And because you're working now in 2D, it's much, much easier to throw away everything you did before. So I didn't, this, this isn't working. Well, I can't really throw it away because I spent $50,000 on the motion capture of this guy and it's not, it's not working, but I have to shoot on it in some way. That's how games turn into Duke Nukem Forever. Which I actually honestly can't wait to see that come out because it can be so hilarious when everybody realizes that it isn't really worth the, the 15 years' wait. But if, you're, if your game is easier to build, it's easy to throw away. And you must, must throw away. It's a requirement. It means you can develop your concepts faster, and it means that you can <coughs> fail faster. Now, a lot of people, when, I see, when they see this slide, they go, fail faster? I'm not going to fail. I'm not in this business. If I failed, then I've, well, I've, I've, I've failed, haven't I? But when I say fail, I mean deliberately choose to fail. There's, uh, uh, who here has heard the phrase, uh, plan to throw away, you will anyhow? Yeah, a couple of you. Same as you games. Failing quickly means that it's very easy to determine what works and what does not. Okay, so that's, that's point one. Games are, uh, 2D games are very easy to, to, to build and very easy to prototype. Second reason, this is for the players. 2D games are very compelling and they're very easy to get into. As a game player, if you're presented with a 3D game, the very first thing you must do is learn to control it and interact with the world. But with a 2D game, you still have to do that, but it's a lot easier. There's less work needed on your part as a player to learn to come to grips with the vocabulary of control in your game. So 3D control is very hard to do. Who here? honestly enjoys playing a first-person shooter on the iPad or iPhone. Not a single one of you, usually there's at least one, but not a single one of you enjoys controlling a first-person shooter on the iPad. And the reason you do that, of course, is because there's thumb pads in the way and you've got to figure out how to move it and you're working with a touch screen. And... So 3D control is very hard, but 2D control is much easier. Remember, you're already working in 2D. The touch screen is 2D. It's a flat plane. So your touch is mapped directly to uh, the world, which it doesn't in uh, 3D. Additionally, because you're working in 2D, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, your uh, game is going to be less resource intensive. So a 3D game needs to load meshes and textures and sound and a big world, and maybe not everything needs to be shown on screen at once, but it needs to be there in memory so it can be quickly dis displayed. And while that's still true for 2D, because you're working in one less dimension, there's less stuff that you need to present. 
It's, it, it's fairly obvious. There's less stuff that you need to have in memory. Now, because there's less stuff that you need to load in, you have in memory, that means that, for one thing, you're going to have uh, memory warnings a lot less often, because you're usually holding stuff in memory less. And additionally, it takes less time to load it into memory in the first place. Now, the reason why you want to do this is because when you tap, think about the actual use case for your game. So it's kind of odd to think of a game having a use case, but really the, the goal of a game from the user point of view is to fill some time. They don't need your game to do useful work, at least not any useful work uh, in the traditional sense. The actual only useful work that your game will uh, provide to the user is it will fill some time in an interesting way. Now, time spent waiting for things to happen is not time spent in an interesting way. Your user will either sit there waiting, staring blankly, saying, oh, I'm, I'm assuming things are going to happen. And maybe it will, maybe it won't. Or they'll uh, go and uh, they'll launch it and they'll go and do something else, and already you've lost them. As soon as your user looks away from the screen, you've lost them. Because now they're no longer committed to your game. They're no longer willing to participate in the world you've created. So if your time to load is very, very low, then you can tap on the icon, bang, you're in the game instantly. You've got the user, you've gripped them. And they belong to you. They belong to your game. So you want to keep the user from being bored when the app finally loads. Finally, the other reason is that building a 2D game is a lot of fun. A lot of people say, oh, the game industry is such a grind, and there's always people being, and, uh, uh, Matt Gallagher this morning said, uh, there's always um, somebody coming in to, to, to replace you. And that's true. Because a 3D game requires so much work and so much participation from other from people. And it requires you to uh, be, be part of a team and it's no longer your uh, shared, it's, it's no longer your sole vision. A 2D game doesn't require so many people. It requires just you. It requires you and your idea and your execution of that idea. Which means that you have a lot of fun building it. It's a very exploratory process building a game, building a 2D game. 2D, game, 2D games are, are very, very unbounded. If you're working in 3D, then there's maybe uh, eight or nine uh, genres that are established. There's the first-person shooter, where you, uh, there's the guns and moving forward and shooting down uh, hordes of faceless enemies. There's the role-playing game, and it's cousin, the role-playing first-person shooter. There's you know, strategy games. There's, you know, there's all these established genres that are very difficult to break out of. 2D still has these, but it's less of a problem because it's quite an unbounded uh, field at, at present. This is like to change in the future once people start realizing 2D is so fantastic. But because 2D was left alone for so long, its fields have become fallow, and now it's very, very fertile. There's so, there's so much room for creative expression in 2D right now. OK, so that's a bunch of reasons why you're working in 2D. All right, all well and good, but how? So if you're like me, or at least if you were like me about five years ago, then your, your process for thinking of a game would be, I enjoyed playing this game, I want more like it. I mean, most games, if you play, uh, if you play a fun game, you think, that would be cool. Let's, I, I wouldn't mind making something like that. I mean, who, who here has thought something along those lines? Yeah, I want something more like my favorite game. Or it would be my version of that game. And often you, you start thinking, wouldn't it be awesome? This would be the best game ever. Oh, it would be so fantastic. It's going to have explosions and have role-playing elements and with a twist of adventure in my gameplay. And uh, also, because I, don't, I, I, I want to have money, I'll monetize it using a freemium model. And, and blah, 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 blah. nobody cares. That is not what your game really is. That's a bunch of buzzwords. Buzzwords are not gameplay. Your game is not defined by what you want it to be. It's not defined by what you, want, what you finally envisage it as being uh, as it applies to you. And so you think, OK, well, I don't want to focus on buzzwords. I don't want to focus on uh, you know, all, all these concepts that are kind of nebulous but uh, I think should still apply. I, I, I'm, I'm past that. I'm a, I'm, more, I'm a more mature person now. So I think, well, I'm going to build upon something that I already know and explain why it's going to be better. So in that case, my concept has become, it'll be like Minecraft, but on the iPad and globally persistent. Minecraft fans, anybody? Good. So this is better, but it's still pretty meaningless. Because you should not describe your game ideas in terms of other games, because it's creatively crippling. 
and it means you're constantly looking over your shoulder to see how other people are doing it. As soon as you define your game based on somebody else's game, then instantly you've locked yourself down to a tiny subset of, of, of another person's ideas. So you, it's great to take inspiration, but you should not say, Italy, it's like Deus Ex, but 2D. As soon as you've done that, then you're now no longer making your own game, you're making somebody else's game with your contribution. So the next iteration of your game concept should look something like this. Your game is not defined by what you use to describe it. Your game is defined by its gameplay. Not by the words you use to describe the gameplay, but the gameplay itself. And gameplay is, described, is defined by three things. I'm about to tell you what they are, but before I do that, it's important that I give you a disclaimer. This is not the only way to think about game design. This is only one way, and it works very well for me, but it isn't the only way. And I'm not going to try and prescribe for you the one true way of game design. I'm showing you my way of game design. Okay? Not the, not, this is not the only way. It's called MDA. Who's heard of this framework before? MDA for game design. Very good. Okay. MDA stands for Mechanics, Dynamics, and Aesthetics. Is the three foundations for gameplay design. This was designed by a guy named Mark LeBlanc, who uh, works for Mind Control Games, uh, and he also is one of the guys who was behind the framework for the Eight Kinds of Fun, which is Sensation, Fantasy, Narrative, Challenge, uh, Fellowship, Discovery, Expression, and Submission. So his uh, framework, which has been fairly uh, uh, seminal. So three components for your game. This applies not just to 2D games, also 3D games, but it's very easy to apply it uh, mentally to a 2D construct. First of all, there are your rules, which are the mechanics. So these are the things that you can write down. These are things you can express on paper. This is, should be the only thing that you try and express on paper in terms of how the game plays. So the mechanics are things like the actual behavior of the game. What happens? The rules. An example of this is Mario. There are certain rules in Mario, in, in Super Mario Bros. The first rule, in fact, the goal of the player is to get to the end of the level. That's the only, that's really the only goal. It isn't about collecting coins. It isn't about saving the princess. It isn't about jumping on Goomba's heads. It's about getting to the end of the level. That's the only goal of the player. To get to, the, to, to allow the, the user to achieve this goal, we provide extra uh, mechanics like jumping. When you press the A button, you can jump. And it makes a little uh, retro 8-bit noise where it goes doo and jumps up. OK, so that's, that's, that's another mechanic. That's, that's uh, the movement mechanic. To add some difficulty uh, to the game, we add more mechanics, like touching enemies means you lose a life. Okay, so now we have more constraints and pressure being placed on the player to uh, cause them to react in certain ways. I'll explain how those ways interact in a second. And finally, there's another rule. Th these aren't the only rules of Mario, as, you, uh, as I'm sure you know. There's, there's more rules than this. But these are the four core rules. Jumping on enemies means you kill them. So, You've given the, the, the player a mechanic for taking control of the world. It's no longer running around and avoiding obstacles. It's now you, you, you've given the player some agency in the game. Now, mechanics are one of those things that lead to the formation of genres. And they form uh, fairly uh, established memes inside games. One of these memes uh, that is mostly seen in uh, first-person shooters is the idea of a rocket launcher. And the three mechanics behind a rocket launcher is that it has slow shots, low ammo, expensive ammo, and does big damage. And you see this everywhere. And this is really well established, the rocket launcher. And you, other, you also see other stuff like the pistol, the machine gun, you know, the rail gun. And they take different names, and they come in different forms, and they might have different twists, but really they're all the same. Try and avoid uh, mechanics memes if you're trying to create a really innovative game. So if you're trying to create something brand new, Learn to recognize and isolate and remove these kinds of uh, repetitive and often used uh, set pieces. That said, these memes exist for a reason. Players already know about a rocket launcher. They know that if they have the rocket launcher, it'll be expensive, that it'll be big and, and, and heavy, and it'll do lots of damage. Probably a bit of splash damage as well. So players already know how to use a rocket launcher. It means that you have less to communicate. Most of the work has been done for you by the player, and that's a tremendous boon. So 
it isn't always the case that you're trying to create a brand new gameplay experience, and if you do, then you're probably trying to do something really avant-garde, which I commend you for if you're doing, but uh, be careful. Okay, so this, is, this forms part of your uh, vocabulary, these kinds of, of, of mechanical patterns. Now, the mechanics are mostly numbers. They're mostly about timing or about the actual behavior, the actual representation in code of uh, how your game works. And because they're the, things that, the, the parameters in your game, it means that they're very easy to configure to create balance. So balance is where you're creating a, a feeling of fairness to the player. Now, fairness doesn't mean that the, 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 the player finds it easy enough or that if you're being, doing a multiplayer game that it's, uh, there's an even split. It also means that uh, you're allowing the player to be fair to the game. Because really, a game that is too easy is meaningless. A game that is too easy is maybe nothing more than an interactive movie. And that is not what people uh, want to play a game for, in most cases anyway. When you're creating a balance, you should be designing it so that the player feels like they're giving the game a fair shot at being able to beat them. So that's mechanics. I'm going to talk now about dynamics, the second prong in the triad there. Dynamics are about how the player interacts with your mechanics and how players interact with each other in the context of your mechanics. So, for example, I'm going to give you an example from Counter-Strike. Who here remembers that? <laughs> still actually quite popular. It's one of the most popular FPS is still around. Not, not even know that. People just seem to think that it's just gone away now. But it's not the case. Counter-Strike. So, in Counter-Strike, and uh, who here has never played Counter-Strike, by the way? Ever? Okay. In Counter-Strike, there is a uh, weapon called the flashbang. It's fairly, okay, and you throw it, and if somebody's looking at it when it goes off, then they blind them for like five seconds, and you can then use that to your advantage. Okay? That's a dynamic right there. So if you use a flashbang, then you, you need to aim, aim it well and use it well, and then you can, if you use it well, then you have the dynamic of being able to successfully flashbang a player and then, you, and then attack them when they're blind. But you can also look away from a flashbang, which, which, which means it won't affect you. So you'll see... Uh, in good play, that people will actually spam flashbangs. They'll actually group up and they'll all buy, buy flashbangs and they'll throw them in different directions. So it's, it's, it's impossible to look in a direction that does not contain a flashbang, which means that your uh, attack will be more successful. So that's, a, that's an example of a dynamic, of people realizing that the mechanics of the game cause certain behaviors and they can adapt to those behaviors and use it, use it to their own advantage within the game. That's the example of a dynamic. So designing a good dynamic means that you're designing for the developing skills of your player. It means that you're trying to uh, develop skills within your players and then realize how they'll develop and predict them and then use them to your, to your advantage as a, as a game designer. So it's about being predictive and understanding how people are likely to react to your rules. So I mentioned mechanics and I mentioned dynamics. The third one is aesthetics, which is the theme of your game. I mean, it's all well and good to think uh, in the abstract, you know, I have uh, a token that means that I take less damage. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, the theme of your game is what people will remember. They will come away thinking that uh, uh, Legend of Zelda, fantastic, you, you were Link and you had a sword and, and a horse and it was amazing, but really what it's really about is about puzzle solving room by room. But nobody thinks that. People just think, oh no, I said the princess. That's what, it's, that's what the game about. Well, really, no. As a game designer, you know that really it's about collecting the inventory and managing your, your, your puzzles and thinking laterally, etc. Et, et so, it's almost uh, it's almost a trick that you're playing on the user. It's almost that you're thinking uh, you're, you're making the user uh, think that it's about one thing and really it's about another. But uh, and that's kind of true. But mm. so aesthetics set the theme of your game. Don't start with this if you can avoid it. Because it's often very tempting to say, I'm going to make a space combat game, and it's going to be so good. And it's going to be uh, in 2D, and it's going to drive around, and it's going to have explosions, and it'll look like this, and it'll have uh, this kind of music. I'm going to use Bear McCree's music because I love his theme and everything. That's, that's a very dangerous way to start, because it means you've locked down the uh, possibilities for your mechanics and your dynamics into, once again, it's like building a game off somebody else's. So try not to start with this. Now, it's often... Uh, the case that uh, you're given a goal, 
like uh, if you're doing uh, work, work for somebody else, as I have done, uh, where, you're, where you're told, OK, I have this theme, make a game around this theme. And often that's, you have no other choice but to do that. Uh, and uh, there's no way you, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that it's impossible to make a, a good game starting from aesthetics, but I'm saying that it is harder in many cases. So aesthetics set your game. They define the game's position in the player's mind. Aesthetics are what they'll remember, but the mechanics and the dynamics are what they'll enjoy. In the instance of playing the game, as they're playing, what they'll say, this is great about, is the dynamics and, and mechanics. But after, a, a, a day later, and you say, well, what did you think of that game? They think, oh, it was amazing. The, 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 the smokestacks rising from the crippled buildings and the, and the sounds, the alien marches across. That, that's what they'll remember. They won't remember the fact that they really, really enjoyed the timing of the jumps. It's important to always remember that you should show and not tell your aesthetics. The best game, this is, this is true for almost every creative medium, for writing and television and film and also games. You should not rely on exposition to, give, to set it in your mind, because otherwise you're actually relying on uh, your player to uh, uh, absorb and properly interpret. Instead, you should simply show. The best games do this. Uh, Half-Life does it amazingly well, because there's almost no exposition in the entire game, and it all relies on you seeing certain things uh, in the background and thinking, what can that mean? and you form your own story in the mind. The story in the player's mind is always better than the story that you, told, that you tell them. Because they made it themselves, and they're very proud of it. The, so that, that's, that's the reason why so many people uh, are, are thinking of uh, their own explanations of what happens in these games. Now, this isn't always the case. Always, some games do a very good job of telling rather than showing, and an example of that is Bioshock, because uh, it told a story so well, and made it so immersive, and uh, it, it, basically wrote it very well, that uh, they're able to get away with uh, telling and not showing, although they did a bit of showing as well. So these things are not by any means uh, separate. They all uh, depend on each other and uh, interact with one, with one another. The aesthetics are not separate from your, your mechanics. If you're doing a, uh, an RPG, then it's probably likely uh, sorry, a, a medieval RPG, then it's very likely that uh, your setting requires your player to have a sword. Now, a sword is a mechanic in and of itself, because it's a melee weapon, it means it needs to be a certain length, it needs to be a certain kind of sharpness, maybe you have a mechanic of uh, it gets dull over time. So already, this aesthetic is controlling the, mecha the mechanic. And the mechanic, of course, leads into dynamics, and the dynamics will, cha will, 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 will change your aesthetics. And it goes, it goes always, all, all the way around. Okay. I'm going to talk a bit now a little bit about designing your applications for, uh, based around your, uh, the input available to you. Now, I mentioned before that a touchscreen is a 2D plane. Players cannot yet reach inside an iPad and grab something. Not yet, anyway. Give it a, give it a year. So what that means, then, means then is that you should design your games for touch. So I spoke about this briefly uh, in my uh, most recent uh, talk about uh, an hour ago, about how you should design your applications for direct manipulation. The same is true for your games. If you have, for example, a strategy game, it makes more sense for you to be able to touch a, a, a character and, and, and move it somewhere else than it is to try and uh, in control it through some other means. Uh, 2D games are great for direct manipulation because you can simply reach out and touch them. I have a pathological hatred of virtual joysticks. And if you're in my uh, other talk, I also ranted at length at this as well. A virtual joystick uh, is badly shown on this projector. Uh, but a virtual joystick means that your player has to work through a layer of abstraction. They have to, before they can even interact with your game, they have to start thinking in terms of your interface. So you have to realize, oh, okay, so this circle here means movement, and I need to move that around. Okay, all right, now I have to think in with both hands at the same time. And it's very tempting to, to go from consoles to touch screens and think that they're the same thing, when really they're not. They're really completely different. If you're doing something like this, then your game becomes filled with clutter and distraction, and you're distracting your players from the content of your game. If you're forcing your player to uh, control the game indirectly, then you're destroying the metaphors that your mechanics and your dynamics and your aesthetics are, are trying to create. 
So a first-person shooter, instead of saying, you have a gun and you need to fight for your life, really what you're saying is, you have these two circles and they control your world. It's the wrong metaphor you're trying to think about. And it forces your player to think uh, in terms that are outside the world you're trying to create. A game that does this really, really well is Flight Control by Fireman. Any fans of Flight Control in the room? Flight Control works so well because you can reach out, touch the planes, drag them to the landing strip, and that's the only, that's actually the only mechanic. The only mechanic here is uh, touch, drag, make a path, put it on, on the ground. That's the only mechanic in the entire game. And all the interface is designed around uh, making this mechanic possible. It's all it's about. And the dynamics that come from that mechanic include making sure that, uh, for example, you, you, you do a thing where you, your first plane follows a certain path, and then you have to make sure they follow a similar path so they come in queue and they never collide, and then you have to make sure that uh, things don't try and uh, cross their path too, too quickly. And of course, the aesthetic uh, really hammers that home. So the, the music, the retro 50s theme, the, uh, the cartoony style of it, it all just comes together very well in this game. So that's touchscreens. Touchscreens are so important for making a good uh, game experience and using them right. Next up, there's the accelerometer. The accelerometer is such a gimmick when it comes to games that it's difficult now to design a good control scheme that works. Generally, the use of the accelerometer is quite bad except for racing games. People don't actually like shaking their device around. They, they don't. If you shake it around, then you're often you're trying to uh, dislodge something or you're trying to fix something or it's like, it's not working, shake it. Unless your game involves the simulation of a physical object that you'd hold in your hand, which is what the user is actually doing, then you should not try and shoehorn the accelerometer into it. So a lot of people think, well, OK, uh, the accelerometer, I'm making a uh, side scrolling game. Um, I'm going to tilt it. Tilting is, is fantastic because it means a movement. Well, that's not very intuitive and graspable because motion is invisible on the screen. Motion can, it can't easily be shown to the player unless you try and create little iconographs that uh, represent how, uh, how movement should work. But what the player is really doing in, in real life is holding this thing holding this piece of uh, metal, whether it's like the uh, size of a piece, piece of paper for the iPad or the size of a small notepad in, in, in the case of the iPhone. So unless your game is actually representing the control of a real physical object, you should not use the accelerometer at all. So there are games that use this really, really well. And in fact, there's a game whose name I've unfortunately completely forgotten that I saw outside the steps of uh, WWDC in 2009. Uh, two people were actually, were, appeared to be doing a sword fight uh, with invisible swords. And it turned out that they were both control, uh, holding iPhone, uh, iPhones that were linked over Bluetooth and were using the accelerometer to, to simulate their sword slashing movements and detecting movement. And it was amazing. It was so much fun to, to have a pretend sword fight with invisible swords because you were working with a... Uh, physical representation in your game. Okay. Now, there are some common traps when designing gameplay that you, it's quite easy to fall into. The first one is the trap of constant and uh, small and minute adjustment and refinement of your game. So, for example, my character, he, he jumps too high. He, uh, for example, uh, I, I don't think that uh, he, he, he jumps... Uh, he's, he's, way too high in his jumping and it's making it too impossible and it's not really believable or realistic. So I'll just bring down a little bit. I'll just bring down a little bit uh, of, of, uh, of control and then, oh, no, it's a bit, not enough, a little bit more. Don't do that. You end up losing yourself. Instead, you should follow this rule by Sid Meier. Who, who here uh, knows who Sid Meier is? Good, I'm in the right room. Okay. Sid Meier's rule of halves says that this is the wrong way of doing this where you have, say, monster strength and you want to adjust it and make it a, a, a balanced and playable uh, uh, value. So the uh, obvious way to do it is to say, oh, it's too powerful, I'll just bring it down a bit. All right, bring it down a little bit. No, it's still not powerful enough, I'll bring it down a little bit further. Uh, uh, maybe two, and then bring it back up a bit. Just mindlessly and repetitively adjust it until you get so lost in the depths of your own creation that it just becomes really, really boring as a gameplay experience and for you as the game designer. 
Instead, do it like this. This monster is too powerful. Reduce its, its strength by one half. OK, now it's not powerful enough. Bring it back up by one half. Use this. Always follow the pattern of undershooting and overshooting until you have it right, instead of trying to adjust it and adjust and adjust it, because otherwise your baseline is constantly being reset. Another uh, issue that you can uh, fall into is designing for coolness first. So that's one of the things I, I spoke about uh, earlier, where the first thing you think about is, wow, that explosion is pretty good. I'll have, I'll have some of those. Don't think of a design that's based around some, a, a, a single thing that's immediately appealing to you, like a specific scene in your game, like the amazing scene uh, at the end of uh, Quake 4 where you finally get rid of uh, the final boss. Because that way you're, again, designing around a specific thing that is difficult to expand upon. It's quite bad. Instead, you should be designing for an entire experience. You should be saying, I really enjoyed the way that this game made me feel. Or, I re take it beyond games, I really enjoyed the way that um, walking down the street feels in the middle of the night. I feel kind of, it's kind of edgy and tense, and I don't know what's going on, maybe sometimes, and I want to cr convey that in a game. If you start with feelings, then it's always a lot easier to refine and build upon, rather than saying, it's not enough like this thing that I can point to. Then you won't fall into traps. You should always, 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 initially at least, prototype your game on paper. Now, paper, a lot of people say, OK, so I start by like, what, like designing the game on, on, on paper with a board and the pieces, and I have to like, make a, a, a board game version of it. No, you don't, in fact. You don't have to do, uh, represent the game on paper. Instead, you should break down the game into its component gameplay elements. So don't, if, you're, if you're making a board on paper, then you're doing it wrong. Instead, think about things like, what, what, what do players really do? I mean, in Halo, what do players really do? They shoot things. OK, what does that mean? It means that they have to have, take cover, they have to manage the ammunition, they have to use the right weapon for the job, they have to, uh, you know, think, think of that. So represent those mechanics in whatever is easiest for you, and then you can use this to iterate very quickly over uh, the dynamics of those mechanics. Think about what actions the player will be taking in your game and how those actions lead to dynamics. Finally, remember that the hardware of your device is for you. So it's for you, but also you are for it. Your, your application is designed to work inside of the framework. So one thing that I often say to people is that you should not dream bigger than will fit on the device. Don't try immediately and say, I'm going to make a 3D MMO, or even a 2D MMO, and it's going to uh, scale, it's going to be huge, it's going to have uh, its own economy in the game and be so, so fantastic. Don't forget the screen is really tiny. Don't forget that the user has a certain context that they are, uh, the, the player does not exist for your game. Your game exists for your player. So think in terms of what the user wants out of your game rather than what you want to convey. Additionally, think about how the user is holding the device. If, if it's an iPad, it's likely that and, and in the playing game, it's likely that it's being held with uh, one hand, or they're usually in bed, or they're sitting just uh, in, in, in a sofa. As with all other applications, your game is a second-class citizen on the OS. You will get interruptions. You will receive phone calls. The user will hit the home button. The user will get rid of your application, which means that you should always, always, always save your state at all times. Just like other applications, your, applica your game needs to act like a well-behaved iOS app. It should always allow the user to jump back to where they were before. <coughs> gameplay is work. In terms of the user's brain, gameplay is stuff that they had to do to get to a certain point. You should, always sorry, you should never throw away saved progress. Additionally, you should uh, handle multitasking as well. This is something that not, not many games do very well, in fact. A lot of people still think that uh, there's a necessity to explicitly save uh, when, uh, uh, sorry, explicitly force the user to save. Multitasking means that there's, uh, there's kind of a, an ambiguity as to whether your game has quit or not. So the solution, of course, therefore, is to always save all the time. A couple other tips and tricks. Uh, one of them is my, one of my favorite uh, for using OpenGL and the Retina display. 
OpenGL, uh, unlike UIKit, is pixel-based rather than point-based, which means that creating a retro mode is easy because you simply bind a low-res uh, viewport and suddenly everything is blocky. And of course, as you know, the, the bigger your pixels are, the more indie your game is. Finally, of course, don't forget that you have very limited resources on the iPad and the iPhone, as, as, as well as the I, iPhone 4. Remember, they're all still tiny, tiny devices. You have low memory. You have a very, very low uh, processor. And of course, the thing that uses battery. Don't chew up batteries. If you do that, the user will become very annoyed. They will not play your game, and you'll not get the same amount of feedback that you want. So a few takeaways for you. At every stage of making your game, 2D or 3D, you should polish at every stage. You should always make sure that your application is as good as it can possibly be at the current level. So don't start thinking, well, I'm going to start labeling all the, all the features, and then I'll polish. I'll make it good after the fact. Don't do that. Instead, add a, a feature and make the game fantastic with that, with that feature alone. Then build upon that. Think of it as you're releasing uh, a version to an audience of one. And you want that, that's as, as good as it can be. If you do this, then you end up with a game that is much easier to improve because there's less upfront work to uh, do those improvements. As I said before, always build fast and fail even faster. If you're failing quickly, you're succeeding. If you're making a lot of mistakes and you're learning from them, then that's fantastic. A good thought exercise that I like to, to do is to uh, make a game in a total of two hours. So always try to make a game in, in as short a time as you can because that way you're adding constraints to yourself that uh, means you don't try and think too big that could lead to uh, th uh, things going wrong or you are overestimating the amount of work that, uh, that is needed. Make a game in as short a time as you can. Once you've got a game done in two hours, expand your scope. Make a game in a day. Okay? And only a day. So cut off at the end of the day. And then repeat that a few times. Get some practice. Make your games and make them fantastic. Thank you. <laughs>